Here, Manitoba, Winnipeg, an apartment building on Furby Street in the West End area of the city. Sylvia Ann Gabosch was 21 years old and pregnant when she vanished from Winnipeg sometime around June 15, 2003. Sylvia had moved to Winnipeg from the town of Swan River only five months prior to her disappearance and lived in an apartment on Furby Street. There are few details about Sylvia's case, which is wrapped in speculation and mystery. There have been some tips about Sylvia's whereabouts following her disappearance, but none can be confirmed. Sylvia was from the small town of Swan River, Manitoba, which is three and a half hours from Brandon and five hours from Winnipeg. There have been reports of drug use and exploitation by way of prostitution. It has been suspected that Sylvia followed her boyfriend from Swan River to Winnipeg and that the relationship was abusive. But the man in question is not a suspect in the case. At any time during this broadcast or afterward, if you have any information that might help solve the case of the disappearance of Sylvia Gabosch, visit our website. Someone out there has answers. Our goal is to find them. Could someone close to Sylvia have played a role in her going missing? Do members of Sylvia's family have information that they have not come forward with? What happened to Sylvia Gabosch? Winnipeg is very different from the town of Swan River where Sylvia grew up. Myrna Gabosch is Sylvia's mother. She has not talked on camera before about her daughter, but she traveled from her home in Swan River to Winnipeg to share Sylvia's story. She now speaks on the last time she saw her. She came to Swan River with baby when she was 21. That's 2003. And uh, I bought her Christmas gifts. She didn't come home for Christmas that time. So her, she opened all her presents and her presents were still there. When she left for Winnipeg, she didn't take them. Just her and baby went. But I had to work that evening. But something, I should have followed my instincts and went to the job and told my boss, my granddaughter is here and I would like to spend the evening with her to find somebody to work. It didn't happen that way. I told them, stay at home, visit. I'll be home right after work. That's like 2.30 in the morning. I come home, nobody was there. Sylvia and her daughter, Tina, were gone. Myrna knew they had gone to Winnipeg. Coming from a small town to the city proved challenging. Sylvia may have become involved in crack cocaine and her daughter Tina was taken from her care. I knew right away they all went because her boyfriend went to Winnipeg, left her at the house. She followed him and she got a place here. He ended up staying with her. Family members knew she was here. Then, you know, next thing you know, they're all into drugs. Then she lost baby. She went missing shortly after. Sylvia's case is assigned to Project Devote, a joint investigational unit between members of the Winnipeg Police Service and the RCMP. Constable Christina Bergen shares the known details. Sylvia Ann Gibosch was a 21-year-old young woman from Swan River, Manitoba. She was living in Winnipeg, but was fairly new to the city, and she was living in the downtown area in an apartment building on Furby Street. She was pregnant at the time, and on June 13th, 2003, she had a uh, meeting, a uh, visitation with her daughter, and then two days later on June 15th, she was spoken to. So those are the last two confirmed um, meetings that, uh, that we had with Sylvia. We had several follow-up uh, tips after those dates. However, none of them could be confirmed. A news release was issued on October 17th, 2003, and again on April 7th, 2004, months after Sylvia was last seen. Sylvia was first um, reported missing by a family member on October 8th of 2003. At that point, uh, we take a missing persons report from the family member and collect as much information as we can. And then we share that information with some of our partner agencies. 
So on October 9th, that information was shared with some of our partner agencies, and then we go about conducting our investigation, which would include interviewing people close to her, including acquaintances, friends, family members, uh, neighbors, and we also attend to locations where she was known to frequent. So that may include um, a corner store or um, a friend's residence where she was known to hang out. So we would conduct those uh, types of queries. Um, and we did that in the following week after we received the initial report. On October 17th, we made a full media release to the public requesting their assistance and advising them of the information that we had. Advocate Leah Clifton speaks from experience about the vulnerabilities that may occur when an individual is struggling with addiction. Once you are into the drugs, you'll do anything to get them. You know, and like at first you might have a job, you might have money, you might have whatever, but eventually, you know, for the most part, you're gonna do whatever you need to do to get them. And you're gonna steal from people, you're gonna you know, all of a sudden one day maybe you're just sleeping with a guy for s drugs and it's not money, so you don't think it's the same thing as, like, selling yourself, right? And eventually you're going you're gonna to do it. Somebody will introduce you to it. Maybe you have a friend that's doing it, and it seems like a good idea at the time. And it's fa it is. It's fast money. It's easy money. But um, you pay a price for it, like, with your feelings and like the way you like you know you feel all degraded. Sylvia's younger sister Nicole Gabosh was only able to accept the fact that Sylvia was gone because of the nature of their last conversation. I just didn't believe it but I, I knew I really really honestly knew that because of our last phone call it was just before she went missing and she told me she needed to leave the city. She needed to get out of there. She needed a bus to get home. I was three days shy from family loans. I would have did anything, but I, I couldn't. With so few details available about Sylvia Gabosch's case, there are more questions than answers. With more than 15 years having passed, since Sylvia went missing. Could there be anyone still out there with tips? How can Sylvia's family cope with the pain of not knowing what happened? Can Sylvia's family and law enforcement bring any truth to discover what happened to Sylvia? June 15th, 2003 is the date Sylvia Ann Gabosch was last known to be seen. Sylvia was pregnant and was already the mother of a little girl named Tina. Sylvia lived in an apartment building on Furby Street in the west end of the city of Winnipeg. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the disappearance of Sylvia Gabosch, visit our website. Sylvia was born premature on July 7th, 1982 to Myrna Gabosch. When she turned 18, we went to the hospital to go get her uh, birth certificate. When I come out of hospital, I thought she was born July 5th, but I was in labor for two days. So when we went for her birth certificate, they said, we have a Sylvia Ann Gabosch born here July 7th to a Myrna Gabosch. And she goes, Mom, and then I was like, Oh my God, you're in labor two days, that nurse told me. That's probably what happened. That, but all these years when she was a baby, I celebrated her birthday July 5th. Sylvia's younger sister, Nicole Gabosch, lights up as she remembers her sister. Me and my mom and her were walking and we just watched the Ninja Turtles all the time. <laughs> My sister goes running to the sewer. She's Michelangelo, Leonardo. She's calling for the turtles. Nicole enjoyed her time with her sister when they were kids and remembers being there for the birth of Sylvia's baby girl. 
Yeah, her girl, Tina was everything to her, everything. I was there when she was born. I cut the cord. She cried because she couldn't breastfeed baby. Like, baby just wouldn't, you know, latch on, and my sister took that hard. Like, she, she was a, a great mama. Sylvia loved her family, but they believe it was the pull of an abusive relationship that drew her away from Swan River to Winnipeg. I just don't know where she met him. That's the thing. Because she never brought him home. But I heard she was living with him in Brandon, and she was going to have a baby. So Nick went over there to be with her when she had the baby. He was nowhere around. I got calls all the time. I phoned his grandma, the boyfriend's grandma, and told her to talk to her son to leave my daughter alone. Because he was being abusive with her, even when she was pregnant. And he cannot deny that today. Myrna had a feeling that something wasn't right with Sylvia in Winnipeg, but she was in Swan River, nearly 500 kilometers away. She tried to find answers when she hadn't heard from Sylvia. I phoned the cops and I told my daughter is missing. So I mentioned her name and they showed me a file. Yes, she was charged for prostitution. One time, they said. And then I knew right away what was going on already ahead of time. Family members told me she was pregnant. Family members told me they saw her on the street. Might as well say, uh, selling herself. I asked family members, how come you never took her in? How come you didn't take her home to the place? I was 300 miles. They saw her on the street, but they didn't offer her a home to try to help her stuff. So I knew right there that there was no help for me here. I had to do it all by myself. And I'm still doing it all by myself. It has been said that shortly after arriving in Winnipeg, Sylvia was led down a path that involved using hard drugs, which quickly developed into a struggle with addictions. Sylvia uh, was vulnerable to being sexually exploited because she suffered from addictions. So for that reason, there was, there was some vulnerability there. In addition to that, Sylvia was from out of Winnipeg. She didn't grow up in Winnipeg. Typically, when we see people come from other communities, I think that increases their vulnerability because they may not necessarily have the same support systems that they have in a smaller community. They may be uh, more trusting coming from a small community, and unfortunately, that could lend itself to um, falling into a crowd that might not be trustworthy and might not have your best interests in mind. Advocate Sherry Shuttleworth speaks about her own experiences to try to help others from going down the same path that leads to addiction. Depression really got me. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental, emotional abuse. I've suffered all those abuses and I managed to, to um, over, like not overcome them, but I've, I'm healing from them. And to be able to face them and realize, okay, like, yes, this happened, but am I going to let this define who I am today? No, I'm not going to. Sylvia Gabosch disappeared more than 15 years ago, and her family aches for her to return. Seven years after Sylvia disappeared, her cousin Amber Gabosch would go missing. Can family and law enforcement come together to bring these cases to rest? Will Sylvia and Amber ever get the justice they deserve? Sylvia Gabosch disappeared more than 15 years ago, and her family aches for her to return. Seven years after Sylvia disappeared, her cousin Amber Gabosch would go missing. Can family and law enforcement come together to bring these cases to rest? Will Sylvia and Amber ever get the justice they deserve? Shortly before midnight on November 10th, 2010, Sylvia's cousin, Amber Gabosch, 
left a friend's home on Bushnell Street in Winnipeg. She walked to the corner of William Avenue and Isabel Street and was seen getting into a mid-90s burgundy Chevrolet Silverado. A police sketch of the man suspected in the case has been released, but Amber remains missing with no closure for her family. Like Sylvia's, Amber's case is being handled by Project Devote. Amber's family has become advocates for her and for other missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, including hands-on work with Drag the Red, where volunteers drag the Red River in Winnipeg for traces of missing and murdered individuals. Prior to the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls coming to a close in 2019, a coalition of human rights advocates raised their voices to call for action from the government. These advocates released a report co-authored by Pam Palmetter and Sheila Day entitled, A National Action Plan to End Violence Against Indigenous Women and Girls, The Time Is Now, asking for a commitment from provincial and federal government to end violence against Indigenous women and girls. Recommendations have been given. Many believe the time for action is long overdue. Each individual Indigenous woman and girl who has been touched by violence has her own journey. In the case of some, abuse, exploitation, and violence led to addictions. Reflecting on her healing sparked strong emotions in Sherry. The supports, having the supports is really important. And, uh, but I know some people don't have, you know, don't have those supports and it's, it's unfortunate, but there is places where you can, you can find that support. Because in the beginning, I know my family didn't believe me. I'd been to treatment. This was my fifth time, <laughs> you know? It's so like, okay, Sherry's on treatment again. <laughs> I mean, but um, I had to look elsewhere for supports in the beginning. And, uh, and they are there if you want them, like if, if you want, really want to get help. But it's, it's, up to the, it's up to you as a person. Like nobody can, nobody can get you to do it or, you know, convince you to do it. You have to be willing to do it yourself. On June 10th, 2013, Winnipeg police released a Crime Stoppers video that portrayed the last time Sylvia was known to be seen. However, this may not reflect the truth of when Sylvia was actually last seen. That's a hard, that's a hard one. Because when I watched that Crime Stoppers video, and I phoned the detectives in Winnipeg, and I told them, why didn't you tell me? And the cops failed me. They failed my sister, like, you know, my niece. Gotta keep praying until she comes home. Every family member whose loved one has gone missing or has been taken away from them by violence longs for answers. We are all connected. We all must support each other. And if we know something, no matter how hard it is, we must come forward. Sylvia was not only a young mother, she was pregnant. What happened to Sylvia and her unborn child? If somebody knows something, write it on a piece of paper and leave it somewhere. <laughs> like, please, like. <sighs> <sighs> Constable Christina Bergen of Project to Vote implores anyone with any information to come forward. If anyone out there has information on Sylvia Gibosh or any of our Project to Vote files, we ask that they come forward. The fact that these girls were sexually exploited is, is, is of great concern to us. And even if you think your information is insignificant or may have been previously given to police, we ask that you um, come forward regardless. We ask that the public contact Project to Vote, and we have a specific tip line designated specifically for our investigations. The phone number is one 888 Six seven three 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 one six. There's also the option of contacting Crime Stoppers, um, and every tip is examined and uh, and, um, and and investigated thoroughly. I can tell you that. Sylvia's mom, Myrna Gabosh, has suspicions that perhaps members of her own family could be responsible for Sylvia's disappearance. Though she can't go into details of her suspicions, her words for them are clear. 
This is the last time I seen the both of them. 2003. But I want the family members that took my daughter and decided to take her wherever they put her. This child needs her mother. This little girl needs her mother. My family members have their babies at home. They tell me, oh, I know where my kids are. Oh, I know where my girls are. Why can't they help me look for mine? If you have any information that might help solve the case of the disappearance of Sylvia Gabosh, visit our website.